Rick, have you ever heard the expression, the customer is always right? Let me ask you something. How intelligent do you have to be to take a food order? Jesus. <laughs> As a special run in hell reserved for people who waste good scotch. Welcome to the Ananas Podcast. My name is Sven, and I'm the founder of Ananas, an online training and management platform for the bar and restaurant industries. And I'm also the host for this podcast, where I get to interview and hang out with some of the most inspirational people in our industry in an attempt to try and figure out what it is they do differently in order to achieve their success. In this episode, we have the ever so wonderful and inspirational Camille Vidal joining us in the studio. Camille is currently based in the UK but recently visited Australia as part of the Sydney Bar Week to host a series of La Maison wellness classes, as well as participating in a number of talks and events throughout the week. I am super stoked she could find time to join us for what ended up being our longest podcast to date. I've had the pleasure of knowing Camille for many years now, and have been watching her career grow as she cemented herself as one of the most loved and looked up to people in our industry, something which was reflected in a recent appearance on the list of the world's 100 most influential bar professionals. Camille is most famous for her role as the global brand ambassador for St. Germain, Elderflower Liqueur, a position that earned her the award for International Brand Ambassador of the Year at the 2017 Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Awards. She's recently left her full-time role as Madame St. Germain to start her own agency, La Maison Wellness, where her focus is on mindful drinking, and what she refers to as living like a healthy hedonist. As you can tell from the length of this podcast, we covered a lot of ground and talked about life on the road as a brand ambassador, what it takes to make it as a bartender, the role of health and fitness in her life, and of course, her more recent move into becoming a self-employed entrepreneur with all that this entails. I found Camille incredibly inspirational, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with her as much as I did. This was a blast. So, without much further ado, kapow! Let's get into this. All right, all right. Welcome to another Ananas podcast. Um, now, with me in our little studio today, I've got, oh God, I should have checked the pronunciation before we started. Um, I'm glad you have Camille, it. you're glad I have it. Yeah, I'm excited to hear that. <laughs> Go for it. Camille? Good Vid- so far. Vidal? That's good. That's it. Is yeah. there more? I mean, I said you were going for La Maison Wellness. I was excited. Oh God! All right, no, no, no. I, d- I was gonna, I, will, I was gonna <laughs> get to that later. <laughs> Come on, we've known each other for years. <laughs> You've got the Camille Vidal. I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm not very good with French. The only thing I can say in French is, um, we might as well do it straight away. Is, uh, est-ce que je peux rester pour le petit déjeuner? Wow! I actually, out of all the random French sentences that people <laughs> told me, that's that's the first. <laughs> Can you stay for breakfast tomorrow? Um, I mean, <laughs> let's do the podcast first and see how yeah, that was, goes. Yeah, I was just showing <laughs> off the only French thing I know how to say. Anyway, so I am so pumped you could join us here today. This is um, thank you so much for taking the time out on your short visit to um, Sydney to come and say hi. I really thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me. I was so glad when you messaged me. I was like, let's definitely make time so we can catch up. Australia is a country that I'm always happy to come back to, um, wasn't happy to leave. <laughs> we'll get into that. We'll get into that. I'm sure we will. Um, but it's a special place for me, Australia. It's definitely where it all started. So Awesome. And we're going to definitely start about that. Before we go back into how it all started, though, can you give me like a quick update on what life today is? Like, what do you do now? Like, what is your life today look like what's a week in your life look like because i don't think it comes across (laughs) as what what people would normally expect from hospitality yeah i mean the past couple of years have been like a really big transition for me um one that was not especially an easy one and it was a lot of questioning on where i could go in hospitality industry how i could remain in this industry and how i could um keep hopefully helping this industry to grow and maybe inspiring some people along the way. Um, And to do so, I went into a little bit of 
more into the wellness and coming like st- remaining in hospitality industry but kind of like taking a couple of years to see how I could combine the two um which I have <laughs> um and it's called La Maison Wellness which is the business that I launched and uh, and the platform that I launched um less than a year ago now and so La Maison Wellness is an online platform dedicated to educate and inspire people on mindful drinking and living like a healthy hedonist. So living well, drinking well and celebrating life in a more mindful way. Amazing. I love that. And what is it? How does that bring you to Australia? So what is your how does that um, manifest itself in like your day to day, week to week work? I think that like the the platform and the business um, has been evolving very quickly which is amazing um it's been very successful so far and um overwhelming you know in a good way but a bit like oh wow (laughs) um learning how to be an entrepreneur and a founder and working by myself um so there's different like aspect i will say and different side of the business there's very much like the brand itself which is the website the youtube channel and La Maison Wellness workshop, retreats, things like that, that I do to build a community of mindful drinkers and help people to celebrate life and live like healthy hedonists. And then there's the other side, which is La Maison Wellness that do a lot of collaboration. So that's the reason why I'm here. I was able to actually combine my true love, which is (laughs) Saint-Germain and La Maison Wellness. So when I came here last February, I had a meeting with Bacardi and um, Penny was like, I love what you're doing. And I think that like it makes total sense to do a collaboration with with Saint-Germain and La Maison Wellness as it has the same ethos of celebrating life and slowing down and taking the time to appreciate good things. Um, so we decided to do Wellness Weekend for Sydney Bar Week. And so there's a side that is for consumer this weekend, which right. is introducing um, mindfulness, meditation and yoga, um, as well as mindful drinking to the consumer and hopefully creating a space for them to feel inspired and learn a bit more about that. And then also for the trade or like where hopefully that space will be somewhere they can come in and recharge. And so it's the same as workshop on mindfulness and meditation with some yoga and created a community um, around and like a connection for the community around something that is not just about drinking, um, but about living well and finding more balance in this industry that is so amazing but also can be quite challenging physically mentally and emotionally oh yeah it's not i tell <laughs> people you know people ask me what i do i go yeah well, i do what on bars or whatever have you and i uh, but i always kind of tell you know it's a f- it's fun mm-hmm. but it's not healthy you know and finding that balance is, is super important i think yeah. let's go let's go back to the, the 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 beginning though like you said not quite the beginning um i want to go back into how you first started out in hospitality and then we'll charter your journey up to where you are today um so can you tell me a bit about your first hospitality job like where did you start out and what was it about it that hooked you in yeah so i was born in the south of france and i grew up in uh, an amazing family of artists so my dad was a writer and was writing plays and had his own theater so I grew up in a theater which was pretty amazing oh, to cool. be surrounded with like comedians and loads of different artists um, and in that bar they w- in that theater there was a bar and so my dad was always like go and like you know pour the beer and pour the wine and I think one of the first thing that my dad probably taught me when I was like not even 10 like probably eight years old was how to make a pastis I'm from the south of France <laughs> learning the ratio between the water and the pastis very important and what is the ratio well depending on like how my dad was feeling I will say that like he wasn't so keen on the water <laughs> <laughs> his ratio was definitely looking more like a fan that um and actual pastis but he taught me that and then he taught me how to open a bottle of wine um so i guess that like that's a bit the connection with hospitality where it started um also because growing up in a family of like with loads of artists and loads of like people coming over i really quickly learned how to 
like what hospitality was and like it was always like adding a plate on the table and having people over or I always said it like I'm quite grateful because I can sleep everywhere because I had to learn I had to sleep in restaurant where my parents were just like having a party until five in the morning because the show was over and they were just celebrating and I was just like five years old and sleeping you know in yes. the corner which is great um and so I think that like that lifestyle um made me really um aware of like hospitality and hosting people and having people over and creating an experience and connecting over food and drinks. But also, um, obviously, growing up in a very creative environment, I felt like I had some creativity and like something that I wanted to express. And I went to an art school and I started working in like hospitality when I was like 14 years old. I work in a restaurant in France. Um, and it was always like I was kind of like seeking for what was my way of expressing this creativity. And I work in like different bars and different restaurants, went to an art school, study communication, event management, marketing. And then when I graduated from university, I was like, I need a break <laughs> <laughs> because I always like work and w like did university, but at the same time was working for like different companies and working in hospitality. So it was quite of a wow. busy um busy life and not so much on there very much just like partying and being you know at uni that's what uni's um, all about man but um i actually decided to come here and i moved to melbourne randomly um i was like didn't speak a word of english at the time and um london was too close and not as exotic as australia and then when i look at the map i was like did a little bit of research decided to go to melbourne um, moved there, landed. I at that time, the way like there's a system that you can do in France where you go to university, but you also work for a company. So I spent four years at university plus a year in an art school, um, being an employee of a company, and then moved to Melbourne. Didn't speak English, so no way for me to like work in communication or marketing. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to like, I was like, I'm going to move there for six months, learn English, like have fun and then come back to France because I had the opportunity of like working for an agency in France. Um, Can I ask what, what, what made you choose Melbourne? Do you, do you remember like what, what swayed Melbourne over Sydney or Brisbane? Or oh, are we get getting Perth? into this? Well, I just want to know because <laughs> in the end, like there's always something that there's a, there's a thing that makes you go, okay, that's, that this is why, you know? I actually had, so my, um, I had family in Melbourne. So All like right. my father ha had a child in a previous marriage and um, I got to meet him when I was like maybe five years old they were like right. your half brother is coming over <laughs> over and i was like excuse me what <laughs> <laughs> who what great um and then didn't get to see him until i was like just before i moved to melbourne and so he came to france and i was like well funny enough i'm moving to australia and he was like do you know where and i was like haven't decided yet I don't know if I want to move to Sydney or Melbourne. He was like, well, I live in Melbourne. I was like, oh, wow. deal. So that's actually how. Um, I'm really glad I did because I loved Melbourne and it was so amazing to live there for, for a few years. But um, And what year was this? Oh, gosh. 2010? No. 2000 and no. Before, I moved there 10 years ago. 2009. 2009, yeah, exactly. Awesome. And, they, and there you worked for some... I remember the... Uh, you worked at Spice Market and Golden Monkeys, is that right? Yeah. yeah, I remember that. So what happened is, um, I feel like I'm getting all the story out there. <laughs> so, so landed, didn't speak a word of English, um, went for a beer with my half brother at Roof Bar. Is that like the? Is that the name? That like um, God rooftop no. bar where above Cookie, up there. Whatever. Yeah, it's called I think something it's called similar. Yeah, or something yeah. like that. So one for a beer there with a uh, with that him. Tough, tough, tough the maybe. I think it's, I think it's cookie tough and, and then roof, roof yeah. something like that, and um and he was like, well, 
actually, and I was looking for a job because the one thing that I didn't want to do was to become one of those French backpackers, ended up just hanging out with French people for six months, traveling, and I just wanted to really experience living in Australia. And so I was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to work. Um, also because I was always um, independent, so I always like work, so I was able to like pay for rent and everything. And so I was like, I'm going to move to Australia, but I'm actually going to work in Australia. Um, so I landed and I was looking for a job. And so um, Bastian, my half brother, was like, "Well, I and I was like, I want to work in the hospitality industry. That's what I love doing. Um, and I'm just here for six months, so it would be great." And he was like, "Well, uh, one of my ex girlfriend works at Spice Market. Her name is Francesca, who now is Andy's wife." Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> and so. Um, so I was like, great. So went to Spice Market, sent a, sent a message to Francesca. She was super helpful. And she was like, yeah, no problem. Like, just say that you know me. Um, had an interview with Jeremy, one of the owner of yeah. Spice Market. And obviously, I mean, you know him, super yeah. busy, not as like, you know, open and um, friendly as he actually is. Uh, but as like first, he was a bit like, who are you? And I was like, oh, I'm just looking for a job. They didn't speak a word of English. So it was quite like challenging. Like my English was not even like basic. It was bad. It was really, really bad. And so he was like, I was like, oh, I know Francesca. He was like, cool. Well, come back tomorrow at 7.30 for a trial. Didn't understand 7.30 had no clue what a trial was. <sighs> so I was like, okay, left. Then Google what trial was. Um, figure out that like they were opening at like 6 p.m. or something like that. So I ended up going for like 4 p.m. I was like, I'm going to do like the setup. And he was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, we had to work. He was like, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I don't know if you remember Ellie. Um, she was one of like the main... Um, manager there was oh, Claire right. who was there at the time and so oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Ellie was like um, I started and he was like okay well w you with Ellie tonight and she's gonna show you around and imagine Spice Market I mean like considering that like I didn't speak English at the time never work in the cocktail bar because I always work in restaurant and like 10 years ago in France the cocktail culture was very tiny like the first time someone ordered a martini to me I was like you want it on the rocks? Like I said, oh, yeah. they were talking about the vermouths because like martini vermouths is quite big in France. Like I had no idea what like a martini cocktail was or et cetera. So um, add on the top of that Australian accent, which is not the easiest one to get into um, in a very, very loud nightclub because Spice Market is a yeah. nightclub. Oh, 100%. And so I think that like Ellie very quickly realized that I actually was totally faking it and I had no idea uh, what she was talking about. I remember that moment when she was like, can you go to the back and get some splits? And I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know. And she grabbed me and she was like, okay, you're just going to stand here and say hello. <laughs> 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 and I spent like four hours looking at like people coming into the club and be like, hello, hello, hi, hello. And I was like, gosh, I just graduated from university from five years, you know, and I was like, why am I here? This is hilarious. But you got um, the job. But I did. I got the job and it was amazing. Like I got to like learn English and learn so much about cocktails. They were very, very patient with me. I remember we had like, I don't know if you remember at Spice Market, we had this like um, kimono uniform. Oh, yeah. Like the orange one. And I used to write every word of English that I would learn every night on my arm. So I would end up with like my arm cover of like vocabulary, English vocabulary that I was like learning during the night and then going home and like writing that in a little notebook. Um, so that was definitely like an experience and a oh, journey wow. and um, learned so much about cocktails. I mean, like I was very much faking it for a long time. <laughs> like, you know, it was like... Fake it till you make it, um, man. It's the way. I remember that night when... Um, a customer order for a Cosmopolitan had no idea what it was, went to the bar and said to Claire, can I have a Cosmopolitan? She was like, excuse me, what? Imagine how like noisy the nightclub is. And she was like, what do you want? Super busy. And I was just trying to like mimic the sound of what I said that customer just said. Um, so that was very much like my first experience wow. um, here in Australia, working in the hospitality industry. And I think that like very quickly, I loved it, first of all, and then very quickly I wanted to learn more about cocktail. And I had the opportunity 
um, Rob and Claire were like, well, Golden Monkey is actually looking for people. You should go and check it out. So I went there, um, studied on the floor, and Joy Tai was the bar manager at the time. Yeah. And she was, awesome. I mean, amazing and definitely one of like the person that really inspired me. Albie was working there um, awesome. at the time who is so talented and creative. And I got there and I was like, they were like, we're looking for a waitress. And I was like, awesome. I want a button. They were like, uh, okay. <laughs> and they were like, well, we'll make a deal. You can do one shift behind the bar. Let's see how it goes. Um, if it goes well, you can do one shift behind the bar a week and then we see. And I work really hard. I learn all my classics and I was very lucky to work in this, in a place where there was a lot of creativity. Like I think that like Golden Monkey was really creative in like the menu that it was doing, but also very like we had a lot of training and um, I was really like the classic was so important as well. So yeah. it was an amazing opportunity to, wow. to be there. Can I also... Working at Spice Market and Golden Monkey, did you learn? I've got a lot of respect for these for the guys who run these venues. Did you learn anything in particular there that in either of those venues that you've kind of believe has served you well in your later in your career? Like any specific things that you've been able to take away from those? Because quite often I find you know the er, the, f the venues where we learn a craft quite often there is lessons there that just stay with us for the rest yeah. of our our time in the in, I mean in the industry. I definitely learned so much from both venues. I think like what was incredible at Spice Market was the team. Like the the staff there was just amazing. Like I found a family there. Like all all the crew was so awesome and they were so dedicated, like, you know, to making sure that like all the guests and we were doing a lot of like, you know, um, like bottle service and VAPs and it was like, how can you be like looking after your guests but also like make sure they're having fun and be friendly but let like it was really good to learn like the like the boundaries of yeah. how can you be like entertain them and have fun but at the same time be super professional and I feel like that I learned a lot about that um and I was like building a team I remember like the first time they were like we used to go to like 1806 after work to um to have a drink and like the first time we all went together and I was like trying to order at the bar and Merlin thank God speak a little bit of French <laughs> and was like how can I help uh. <laughs> I was like can I have a chartreuse and a beer <laughs> and we became best friend but so I learned a lot about that like having a family hospitality was so great and then at Golden Monkey that became very much like I mean that was like my family for for the time that I was there and um, it was amazing because also at that time, Golden Monkey, and I haven't been for, for a while, so I'm not sure how, how it is these days, but at that time, it was very much of a hospitality oh, yeah. spot. Like, you know, so like all the bartenders, so I get to like meet so many amazing bartenders and really like build a community and a family. And, you know, I was like, I mean, my days off were like going to Black Pearl and learn about all classic cocktail and be like, oh, that's what a daiquiri should taste like. Uh, <laughs> I got it now. Oh, good, you know. That's a good place to which learn is a basics, good, And they sure. were very, like, I feel like that everyone from like, you know, Matt to Heisted, like all those guys were very much like taking me like their little sister and um, taught me so much on how to, to be a bartender for sure. Awesome. I mean, I was living with like Greg yeah, I was going to come to this actually. So Greg, I mentioned to Greg that I was going to talk to you today and he reminded me of a story that, I, that oh I'd gosh. love to hear from you. Oh gosh. So Which one? Well, I'm going to say <laughs> it appears that would have seemed what seemed like a massive setback at the time turned into a massive and life-changing positive. Do you know what I'm referring to? I think I do, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that any bartender that was like living in Melbourne at that time, we'll probably know about that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it starts with winning a uh, cocktail comp and traveling to Tales of the Cocktail. How Which did that, that was like a very big, so knowing that like for me, it was like I was working so hard to like learn my classic. And also it was like, you know, we're saying that like I grew up in a, in a fami in the family of artists and I always felt like that I had creativity inside me. And I remember the first time I like set one foot behind the bar and actually started making cocktail, uh, that was like a bit of like an epiphany moment for me because it was my way of being creative. And, and that's why I fell in love with this industry. It was like the creating a cocktail that like tastes amazing and, um, 
is a full experience was amazing. So like going from not speaking English to learning all of that and then winning a cocktail competition where actually a lot of like those partners also entered it and I ended up winning it. So that was like a big like achievement and first step for me. Um, getting to like go to Tales of the Cocktail was pretty amazing. Just before going, I... Um, James France actually was the distributor for like um, Square One Vodka, oh which yeah. is a cocktail competition that I won, but also was the distributor for Saint Germain at the time. And so just before going to Tells, um, he organized, like Rob Cooper, the founder of Saint Germain, was visiting um, Australia and he organized a um, brunch, a Saint Germain brunch, where I got to meet him. And that's really where everything started. Wow. Then I will let you have the enjoyment of telling the rest of the oh, story. Oh no, you tell me the story <laughs> because I don't know it that well. I, I I only know that you went to you went to Tales of the Cocktail. Had a blast. Had a good time, and then when you arrived back in Australia, things went pear shaped for a little bit. Yeah. So um, so I had the opportunity to like the prize for the cocktail competition with Square One was to go to Tales. Um, because I met Rob Cooper before and we had an amazing connection and he was like, James, friend, I want this person to work on the brand. Um, and so when I went to Tales of the Cocktail, I actually met the whole team of Saint-Germain and um, did some, uh, some work with them, which was great and had an amazing time. And then um, I went to New York because why not? It was my first time in the US. So I was like, I'm going to go to New York City. And Alex was like, message... Um, Sam. Sam. Um, Rose and was like, my friend is coming to you, Tells, and then she's going to New York, look after her. So I think it was like five in the morning at Yellow Bay. Um, I got to meet Sam and I was like, oh, you're Sam. And he was like, oh, you're Cammy. And I was like, I'm going to New York City next week. He was like, cool, crash on my couch. And I was like, epic. Can you remember that tomorrow? <laughs> and then I messaged him the day after. I was like, so we agreed, right? And he was like, oh, shit, yes. <laughs> so I actually stayed with him. Um, with Sam um, for like a week in, a, in New York. So like came back after like the most amazing trip, met so many amazing people. Um, I was just saying, I just like, I met Lee Porter Kavanaugh at the time there. And he was like, I was like, we should totally hang out in, a, in Australia. I live in Melbourne. He was like, I live in London. I was like, oh, uh -huh. well. Um, and then on my way back, um, visa situation, complication, um, they did not let me back in. Man, that would be a that would have been kind of full on, right? So, what was it like to be turned around and to have such a massive change forced onto you? Like, how did you deal with that and turn it around to something positive? Because it's quite a big. That was I really mean, it a was very big deal. I'm I'm and joking I, I um, about it now, but it was devastating. Like, I was very much. To, I, we were talking with like Saint Germain for me to get sponsored to become an ambassador for Australia and New Zealand. Golden Monkey, we were discussing of like me potentially getting sponsored. At, like I was planning on staying, like I wasn't planning on going back. Um, and I remember like um, being devastated also because I was like, I don't want to move back to France. Like I, I feel like that Australia, maybe because it was like the first country where I moved and I was like um, living abroad by myself. Like I, I'm from the south of France and I moved to Lyon, which is a city in the middle of France when I was like 17, so quite young, I left um, my parents' house. But Australia was like the first country when I was like living on my own and I really felt like that it gave me the opportunity to be the person that I wanted to and to find my true calling, working in hospitality and working in the cocktail industry and then having that like taken away was like like heartbreaking. Because when you got turned away, you didn't get to stay at the airport for very long. I imagine you would have left relatively quickly. Also, to be honest, well, actually, to be honest, it's a pretty, like, the, the, the system here is quite tough. You know, like, oh, yeah. the, the Australian government is, there's no, like, room for a negotiation or anything. And they're quite brutal in the way that they do it. And so I was kind of, like, coming back from the U.S. after two weeks of, like, um, having a lot of fun and drinking all the delicious cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and a very long flight to come back. And so they stopped me at the border and they were like, well, you've got only two months left on your tourist visa. You coming with us? And um, I was like, oh, great. Because at that time I left 
went back home and came back on a tourist visa because I was going to Tales. Oh, right. And then we were looking at like sponsoring me. And so it was like that in between what's like, what visa are we going to go for? Yeah. Um, and so um, it was very much of a, you coming with us, we've got questions. And I was like, I don't know, I was like 20. 24 when all of that like I had no clue I was like what is happening like oh, I was still on so like hard. you know my like um and I spent 12 hours being like um asked question in a tiny room wow. at the airport with no food no like no water no break and um and did you get sent back to off to the U to France or the UK or did you get back in the country but so what happened is um the person that I was dealing with wasn't um very um i mean was just doing his job and but n i think didn't really realize how overwhelming the situation was for me i was able to make a few calls um which i called a few people that were strewn at the time um fraser campbell <laughs> and um james friends um uh, being like hey you know the job with Saint Germain? Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. And I was like, I'm getting kicked out of the country. So like that, like those are like the three people that I talked to. Um, and I was like, this is the situation. Shit, what do I do? And then it was all very confusing the way that like it was all happening. But um, so it was like in the room, probably like way smaller than like your studio here. And the guy kept like coming in and out and asking more questions and then leaving and asking more questions. And what they did was they went through my phone, my computer, like everything. Um, and, and they were just like, well, we make the call and we're just going to cancel your visa. Wow. Um, and so while that person said that to me, I was like, but what does that mean? And then one person walked into the room. And I mean, I, at that point, I was like in tears. Like I cried for like a solid like three days straight yeah. i'm pretty sure and so that one um employee walked in and he was like look i know this is really overwhelming and really stressful we're canceling your visa which means we're going to send you back to france this is the only destination you can go to um because at the time Strin was living in a, in malaysia and i was like can i fly to kuala lumpur they were like no you have to go back to paris because you've got a french passport so that's the only destination you can go to and um, wow. and he was like, just so you know, they're going to ask you to pay for the flights and it's going to be insanely expensive. But because you're getting kicked out, this is the responsibility of the airline to get you out of the country. So say that you can't pay, which anyway, I couldn't pay. <laughs> I mean, I was coming back from wow. like New York City where I spent all the money on like delicious cocktail food and um, probably shopping at the time. And so they were like, well, how are you gonna pay for that flight? And I was like, I don't have money. I generally can't pay for this flight. They were like, call your parents, call your friend, call your family, like anyone. And I was like, no, no. And I was kind of like really annoyed because I was like, can I go in and like, you know, take my stuff from my apartment? They were like, oh no, you didn't get it. You're not in Australia, you're at the border, you're not coming in. And I was like, well, if you're not want willing to help, like, this is yeah. just not going to work. And so because of that, they put me in a detention center until the airline figure out how to get me out of the country. And then they just put you on, like, the cheapest flight. So I think it was, like, I did Sydney, Paris in, like, five different flights. They sent me back oh, to wow. the U.S. I stopped in, like, Dallas and, like, all of it. Um, so that was quite interesting. That's crazy. But I remember landing in Dallas and calling... Um, Rob Cooper, the yeah. founder of, of Saint Germain, having a conversation with James, and I was like, I'm getting kicked out. And he was like, Cool, well, we've got, we need someone in France. And I was like, I'm not moving back home. Like, I, I'm not ready to move back to France. Um, and he was like, Well, here's the deal we need someone in London, but also looking after the French market. So you can be based in London, but you have to do Paris and London. And oh, I that's was amazing. like, Which was incredible. So, how I long mean, did like, that take from like, when did you start the job back in... So when did you start a job in London after getting kicked out of Australia? But So I called James French, who was the most... I mean, you know he's him. Lovely. He's, he's just like yeah, the best amazing. person in the world. Um, he, I guess, had a conversation with Rob Cooper, then spoke to, um, to Rob when I was on the way, landed in France, and then they were like, cool, you got 48 hours to go to London. And no I way. was like, what? Um... And I, they were like, yeah, we need you like there on 
that day and I was like, oh, okay. And then what was like, I mean, this show how incredible the community is in hospitality industry. But I really think that also very, very special here in, the, in Australia is Fraser Campbell started because I had generally no money and <laughs> I needed to get on the Eurostar. And so um, Fraser started doing things when all bartenders in Melbourne collected their tips and yeah. sent me that. So I was able to like get a Eurostar ticket last minute, which is insanely expensive, and then get myself like s- set up to to start with Saint Germain in London, which is amazing. I mean, like the power of like community and uh, and how incredible all the those it's connections. It's incredible. I, I mean, I, I, not the same, not not the same, but I had an accident, uh, I suppose, where I broke my f- I broke four ribs and punctured a lung, and one was that was unable to work for two months as a bartender, right, and then. I was working at Tank Nightclub and the, and the entire team there pulled their tips one night and not all of it and donated a good chunk of it towards me so I could afford to pay rent while I was Amazing. while I was sick. I feel this should be the government should be looking after this kind of stuff. We pay income tax, we should get looked after when we get sick. Absolutely. But, but you know, um the the bar team here or the the community is so yeah. amazing. Now, what I was gonna say, um uh after this, so you start working at Saint Germain. Um, I know I botched the pronunciation on that. You hadn't been working there for long when Bacardi bought it in 2012. Um, how did you find transitioning from a small, relatively small family business into a much larger company? I know that Bacardi's family owned, but yeah. still it's a big global business. Yeah. Um, how did you, you know, what was the decision making process for you? Like staying with, staying with a brand rather than staying with, because the, the, yeah, yeah, they had Rob a Cooper still had other brands, yeah. had a portfolio, right? And it was a conversation that I had with Rob. Um, and so, I mean, it was, I'm very, like, learning from Rob was amazing. And even if I wasn't able to, like, be on his team in the US, I had an amazing opportunity to really build the brand in Europe. And I think that, like, because I was working really hard, he gave me a lot of, like, freedom and support he in the sense of he was kind of like you go and do you <laughs> yes um but you know he had me, i mean i met rob and within the time of like a lunch by the end of the lunch he was like i want you to work on the brand you just like he just he was really good at hiring people he was really good at finding people that were right for for the brands that he had um and he was an inspiration i mean he was like his personality was like larger than life and he was just passionate and crazy but i think it takes you know some craziness to be such um a visioner and um and it was amazing to learn from him and to like his attention to details was um incredible and i think that like that would make a big difference and i think that like working for cooper spirit and for rob really like gave me the opportunity to learn how to like to be more of a founder mentality and to do everything on my own and probably like you know to be honest like I can relate to a lot of that now that I have my own business and like how you learn on like juggling it juggling everything and like being very um creative to find ways and then moving with Bacardi um so it was a bit of you know I was with the with the with Saint Germain for less than a year when um, we did the, um, when Bacardi did the acquisition, and I had a conversation with Rob. It was all a bit like overwhelming again because I was like, oh gosh, I'm like just finally like finding my yeah. feet after you know moving from like the other side of the world. And London is an amazing city, but it's not an easy city to like settle in because. It's big. It's huge. It's way too big. But also, like, coming from, like, Melbourne or, like, Australia when, like, y- like I find that, like, h- here people are so friendly and welcoming and direct, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very direct. But I love that. And going from that to London where people are amazing and, like, it's it's such an amazing city, but it's not as, like, open and welcoming at first. And I think that, like you need to crack open the city and when you do it, it's amazing, but it takes some time. And I moved just before winter, which oh, was awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm from the South of France. I can't deal with like, <laughs> like 
wet and cold, which is pretty much London throughout the year, is my vision of hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it took me a little bit of time to like adjust. So like when that again, when like all up in the air um, with with Saint Germain, I was like, oh no, I'm not ready for like um, another change. Another change in them. Um, and then I had a conversation with Rob and he was like, look, you can stay with Cooper Spirit. We have other brand. He was like, you know, we've got loads of work on like Slow and Low, that Rock and Rye Whiskey, um, Creamy Vet, etc. But I was like, Rob, you hired me for that brand, like specifically for that brand because you saw the potential in me in building that brand. And um, I was like, I have to stay with it. I'm not done with like my journey with this brand. And so were you at the time... Uh, a more a European brand of us or still London based, London so France? So ba- I, was, I was doing like UK and France, but like by that I was doing like London and Paris and then a little bit more of like other cities in, a, in the UK um, because I was like, I helped on bringing Speedrack over, working yeah. with like Ria oh, nice. Soler and stuff. But like the focus was very much on like London and, and Paris. And Amazing. then uh, had a conversation with um, with Bacardi, which Bacardi is an incredible company and oh, like yeah. became very much like my uh, my family for so many years. But it was a bit of a they bought Saint Germain, then they were like, "Cool, what's what the now? plan?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we don't have like they didn't really have a team or a budget for it or like so keeping an ambassador on it was a bit like oh. And Rob Cooper was supposed to stay on for like few months like I think it was like the deal was like 18 months which he didn't um so it was a bit of like a big transition and thankfully um Jacob Breyers who is one of my absolute mentor and um has been an amazing friend and uh, and a great guide into like my career really really fought hard like we we definitely we've been we were like fighting to make sure that like I was staying on the brand and he was an amazing support for that that's awesome um can, can I ask, I mean, we talked a lot about Robert Cooper and obviously um, it's a bit of a tough question, this one, but, you know, I, I met him um, as well when he came over to Australia. It's a super lovely guy, um, you know, a massive mentor for you. you. When he passed away on, at, in 2016, so only 39 years old, I was, how's the, how, did you, how did you deal with that kind of a... I know you didn't work for him anymore, but he was such mm-hmm. a big part of the life. How did you deal with that kind of loss and stay whilst working on the brand still just in terms of the yeah i mean it how was to get, how to get through that because i can see that it's such a fucking would have been such a difficult thing to go through yeah and i think that like rob was definitely an inspiration um in my career and i learned a lot from um him and the brand that he built i think that it was almost when he passed away it was, I mean, it was heartbreaking, you know, and um, and he was like, I wasn't in touch with him at all. Like he was in California and he was oh. doing his, his things and it was more of a, now I have the responsibility to make sure that like we keep the brand true to itself and to cam- kind of carry on on like the, the journey of Saint Germain to make sure that like it was what he wanted it to be That's and it awesome. was almost like i f- i felt like it was like taking on that responsibility that it, the best way that i could like honor what he created was to make sure that like we keep on building that brand and to do it in the right way and i think that one of the reason why my job with saint germain at bacardi actually was so amazing is as much as like I had to fight really hard <laughs> to to make sure that like I will stay with the brand and my voice was heard, um, they were definitely hearing what I was saying and they took me on almost as like a bit of a a founder, not that like that I created Saint Germain at all, but more of a we want to make sure that like we keep Saint Germain true to the French inspiration and to um, everything that was done with Cooper Spirit prior the the Bacardi acquisition and so I was like that person for so many years and so that gave me the opportunity to be a global ambassador that had a lot of like um impact in the big decision that were made and that was just incredible to be able to do that that's amazing to be able to build that brand um in the right way as a as a as the global brand ambassador um which is uh you know such a glamorous 
title and 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 job role on the out of at least looking from Instagram. Um, <laughs> oh, in. what good Instagram. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Can you single out like one or two experiences, maybe one experience that you had in this role that that truly stand out for you? That kind of shows, you know, what what can happen in this in yeah. this industry. Like, did you have one like specific experience as a global brand ambassador? You went, fuck, I can't believe that happened. I mean, I feel like that like there was definitely so many um, incredible experience. Um, I think that like what I loved the most about being a global ambassador was how you needed to understand the different culture in each and every country to be able to like build the brand the right way and that's one of the things that I love the most like I got to launch Saint-Germain in Japan go to like go to, to launch Saint-Germain in China to um to do like to go to like so many different countries to build a community around Saint-Germain in so many different countries to really help and support bartenders because for Saint-Germain supporting the community and supporting partners was always really important and that's something that like Rob Cooper did from the beginning um and so that was amazing like I know that like every time I will go to a country I will always like ask the local team on like what's the cuisine in your country what's the palace what's the trend what's the what's are the cocktail that are like people are enjoying at the moment to be able to create something around that that I really really enjoyed um and then like, I mean, yes, yeah, so many amazing moments. Like, I will say that, like, launching the product in China, going to Japan was amazing. Tales was always an amazing experience. A um, lot of work, Tales, I bet. Loads of work, <laughs> but always so great. Building a team of ambassadors. When I had the opportunity of, like, building the Lake Saint-Germain program um, and having to create a brand ambassador program from scratch, um, putting in place all the things that I learned and that I was I was missing when I started because as much as like it made me the ambassador that I became to have to like learn and do everything on my own because I was like in Europe by myself and the yeah. team was uh, was in the US it was really challenging can you I, know can I ask so as a global renowned ambassador I mean you won best international brand ambassador at mm -hmm. Tails in 2017 right yeah yeah um what do you think that you do differently to others that help, have helped you earn such an envious status, I suppose, on the global stage? So what do you, how did you go, what, what do you think it was about you that, that were able to put you in that position? I know it's sometimes hard to, to speak yeah. about how awesome we are, but, <laughs> but obviously that's an amazing accolade to get. And you must have some sort of view on how you do it differently or what you've done to, to, to get to that point. How do you think you approach that role in a way that, that put you up on that stage? I'm making a very long question, so you have time to think about the answer. <laughs> right. um, I mean, I think that, like, I have, I'm a very driven person, and I, I, li I'm, I like a plan, let's say. You know, I'm a person that's like, the plan can change, that's totally fine. The plan can evolve, that is totally fine. But I like a plan, and, uh, and I knew that... Um, I wanted to become an ambassador because for me it was kind of combining everything that I learned and study and love because even if like I was I loved the hospitality industry, I did study communication and event management, et cetera, et cetera. So I had an understanding of like building a brand and I just wanted to combine a bit of everything and I felt like that being an ambassador was giving me the opportunity to do that and I really wanted to represent a French brand because as much as like I left France 12 years ago now and that's like a third of, you know, of my life and like I feel like that yes I'm French but I'm also a little bit from here Australia and a little bit from like the UK and the US etc um it was really important for me to be able to share um my like origin and more than my origin more than like this way of life that we have in France and the the art of the aperitif etc um so I think that like what was different is I kind of like I had a plan a bit, you know. I remember sitting in front of Black Pearl <laughs> um, after closing hours on like the the side um, walk, and with Matt that I call Big Matt, 
um, having a conversation with him and be like, you know, I want to become an ambassador. And he was like, Cammy, you've been bartending for like two years. And I was like, I work in the hospitality industry since I was like 14 years old. And he was like, yeah, but, you know, give it some time. And I was like, Matt, I want to become an ambassador. I want to work for this brand, which was Saint-Germain. And I want to work so hard and become an inspirational brand ambassador that I will be nominated at Tales of the Cocktail in like less than five years. And he was like, <laughs> sure, you're That's right. That's amazing. Do you, do you have a, do you do a, just as a question there, because I do this and I know a lot of people do this, um, do the uh, like vision boards or do you do a, um, like a five year like goal setting? Do you, have you done that? Because it sounds like you set a goal and it did, and it did come true, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that like, I do and I don't. I kind of like, I know when it feels right and I feel like that it was the same with like launching La Maison Wellness. I felt like that that was the, the direction that I wanted to take and it felt right and it was like, you know, when it was for becoming an ambassador, I mean, I went and researched all the brand that like potentially I could see myself um represent and work for and then reach out to all the distributor reach that's how I met you know James friends and everyone and like I was like can we go and have like a coffee I would love to hear more about like your company and your product and like so I was very much of like an active that's um, great so taking a lot of like responsibility to make things happen so I think that's like that's the reason why I've have been quite like um I will say, like, maybe successful oh, very in, successful in, 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 in the world. bit. Like you don't get to be win world's best without being successful. Sometimes you got to accept the praise, <laughs> right? I think that it's amazing. So for me to summarize it, it sounds like, you know, what, what really worked out was, A, having the correct building blocks, so understanding what brands were through your communication mm -hmm. degree, um, having the ability to, to plan and, and run events, having studied that, but also finding the right brand fit yeah. for you and understanding how that's going to work. And that's actually what I was like coming on to is to be an ambassador is, I mean, a lot of bartenders are like, when I retired, I will become an ambassador. And if that's what you think, you are misunderstanding oh, yeah. what is the job of an ambassador. Like it's a job that take over your life. Like it's an amazing role and it's so great, but it's a challenging one. Like, um, and you, if you want to do it, you have to do it for a brand that you truly, truly believe in. And fit. And fit, for That's sure. That's the thing, because I think the thing for you, you embody that brand in so many ways you know, through your heritage, yeah. but also in, I suppose, the brand has many ways become as reflective of you as you've become of it, cause, because yeah. you have come across as a, almost as a founder over the years, yeah. you know? So while you're talking about the, how hard it is as well, what are some of the... So it sounds glamorous to travel all around the world, and it certainly looks amazing on Instagram. But are there any flip sides to that coin that people should be aware of before they pursue a role as a brand ambassador? Like, yeah. what are the, you know, I suppose the, the, the personal downsides that can come with that? I mean, it is very, very challenging. And I think, like, just to, to finish on the, on the point that we were just talking about, I think being really genuine and being yourself is so important. And I think that's why... Um, like for me being an ambassador was never and even if like I built Madame Saint-Germain and all like the the persona around it it was never about me it was about building the community and it was about supporting the bartenders and using the platform that I had which was Saint-Germain to be able to like help this industry to grow and that was from you know being like one of the first sponsor of speed rack to launching femme du bar which was the ladies bartender club that i launched almost yeah, 10 we years ago um to doing like giving back to the community as much as i could and i think that like being really genuine and doing it from like coming from my heart is one of the reason why um it was never like me selling on anything it was just having the opportunity to work for a brand that I loved and really believed in and to have this like brand helping me to grow that community um but so to to come on to your point as like the it's really challenging to be an ambassador it's amazing but it's like um I think I remember when I was like building the the L'Equipe Saint-Germain program I had um one of the questions that I was asking during the interview was, what do you think, what is your understanding of 
the role of, amb- of an ambassador? Like, what do you think you will be doing? And one um, bartender that I was interviewing was like, well, I don't know. I guess, like, I'm just going to go around and, like, swipe my, like, cr- like corporate credit card and just, like, buy a cocktail for myself and everyone else. And I was like, oh, gosh, yeah. we are definitely not showing, like, the reality of what the job is. Um, and, you know, I remember, like, being based in London and having, like, there were like months where it would have been cheaper for me to actually live in the hotel than uh, than paying rent just because I was always on the road. Or I remember that first time when I came back and all my friends were just like having a dinner party or something like that. And I messaged them and I was like, did you guys not miss? What, what did I not know about this dinner party? And they were like, wait, you in London? Oh my God, come over. We just didn't know that you were here because you're always gone. And wow. it was very much that. It's like you're... Like you're on the road and yes, it's glamorous. And yes, we work in, in an industry where there is community around the world. But it's also the, like, the challenge of traveling, jet lag, being by yourself in a hotel, um, having to handle all this like, you know, like lifestyle that is not always easy. Um, it's also being a brand ambassador and being a bartender is different and like you kind of have to like being a an ambassador you that person that sits between the bartenders and like you understand how it works in bars and like the the nature of the job but you also sit with corporate people that are trying to do marketing and so you kind of like in between the two worlds the same way that like you have to be out and about in bar but you also have to be up early in the morning because you have to (laughs) answer those email and you end up being like in those two which is amazing and I love it but um it it is challenging and I don't think it's for everyone and I think a lot of like partners think that like that feels like um natural like next step um or a way to like get away from the bar but i think that like um i will really encourage everyone that is thinking of taking that path to make sure that they question themselves of do this do they think that like that's something that they want because you do have you work in an office like yes you're on the road yes you're out in bar but you have to understand and to fit in a corporate company and Bacardi is a big one. It's also a very fun one to work for. Um, But there is this, like, you stepping away from the bar for something that is quite different. Yeah, the reason I asked is, I mean, I used to employ loads of brand ambassadors and um, for various brands when I had my agency. And and one thing I'd recommend to anybody who wants to become a brand ambassador is to definitely brush up on your Excel skills uh, (laughs) and do a crash course in PowerPoint and then figure out if you want to spend, you know, half your time doing that kind of stuff. Because it's not what you see on this. It's like an event, you know, what you see happening during the event isn't what it's like to run an event. Absolutely. (laughs) It's what happens before. (laughs) And, you know, or even things, it's like, um, I remember having to, like, have a conversation with one of the the L'Equipe Saint-Germain ambassador being like, I think that you misunderstood what your role is. Like you're not he- you're not a guest. You're not here to enjoy the event. You're here to host the event. You're not here to drink as much as your guest or even more than your guest. You're here to like host everyone and make sure that everyone else is having an amazing time. And it's you know, um, it's the same that like you will say that like a bartender is like the conductor of the yeah. bar and like you're in charge of like making sure that everything runs smoothly and that the energy and the atmosphere of the place is um, on point. But being an ambassador is the same. It's like you have to make sure that like the entire orchestra is going well and to make sure that like you are managing that. Um and then for like computer, I mean, this is hilarious. Like, or even like one of the ambassador that we have at the moment who's doing such an amazing job. Um, he was saying to me, he was like, at first, like for him being in front of his computer for like more than like an hour or two was so challenging. Oh, yeah. Like the, the focus and the attention, like it was really difficult for him. Or, you know, I remember having this conversation with like Ian McLaren when he w- became the, the advocacy director. He, I was like, oh, this is such an amazing role. Like, um, this, is, and also at Bacardi, there's like so many amazing programming. And he was like, literally, my life is about Excel and PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, I'm behind my computer. Oh, That's so, all I do. You know, it's so, so funny. The, the 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 transition from bar into that world is massive. But it's kind of also be, 
you can bring a lot with you as well, which you obviously have. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, um, I'm going to f- mess up the pronunciation, um, Le Femme du Bar. Yeah. So I had not come across this until I did my research. Um, so you said it's been running for 10 years, but what exactly is it? So it's probably a little less than 10 years. Le- it's probably nine. So when I moved to London... You round up. Yeah. <laughs> ten <laughs> sounds better, right? I like ten. Let's go with ten. So when I moved to London... Um, I um, obviously didn't know anyone because it was not planned. We went over that. Um, And because I had, you know, the amazing, like, because of the community, um, I met Lee Potter Kavanagh that I tell of the cocktail just before getting kicked out of Australia, who I called as soon as I found out that I was, like, moving to London, who happened to be like, cool, I've got a bedroom in my flat. Do you want to move in? So that was great. And then Nick Ventil be like, go and meet my friend, Paul Mand, which Paul was definitely a great contact to have oh, yeah. um, as, a, as a first person to, to meet in, a, in London. Um, but um, it was very much um, about like me trying to like build that network because as much as like I had a network and an amazing community in Australia, in London, they were like, who, who, who's that chick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I decided that like I wanted to work in the bar um, because it was a bit of a I'm an ambassador but I'm a bartender and I wanted to like make sure that like people will understand that so I moved to London worked for Saint Germain but I was also working at ACC Experimental yeah. Cocktail Club in Chinatown where at the time um, Nico De Soto just left to open New York City um, just a few weeks after but Thor who is now here in, uh, in Australia right. was the bar manager there which was so great um, And so because I didn't really know anyone and um, I guess I had like a really amazing support system also of like women in Australia, like Joy Tai being one of my mentor and so many like not that many women, but still some really like strong women like Alex Royce is, you know, obviously like a a very um, incredible person in the hospitality industry. And so I was kind of like lacking that a bit in in London and I was like, I really want to set like a platform that will be for women to like get to know each other and inspire each other. And I feel like that sometime in hospitality industry and even these days is if you don't know that you can, if you don't have like a role model or an image of like being like, oh, so there is women owning bars and, you know, managing bars and like and being global ambassador, etc. Like you don't really think that you can. Um, and so the idea was like I wanted to mix all like women in hospitality industry from like bar manager to bar owner to very junior bartenders to more senior bartenders to like waitresses that wanted to like jump behind the bar and learn how to make cocktail for them to be able to have that support system and that community and learn from each other and so I launched Femme du Bar which ended up being in collaboration and in partnership with Saint-Germain became um, something that I was doing in Europe, which was gathering, um, which was cocktail competition where we will like uh-huh. send um, the winner in like different countries to like learn more about like um, the community in different countries and get to do like guest shift and um, l- different workshop on building skills. Um, that could be from like learning how to create perfume to learning like different source of like inspiration when it comes to like cocktail creation. So that's something that I've done. Um, Is it still running? It is still running. Um, It's very much something that now happened in like France and and the UK. Um, I'm still involved in this platform as that's something that like I started and Saint-Germain wanted to keep it um, true to like its origin so I still do some uh, some event I also do very m- like mentoring and supporting women in hospitality industry has always been something really important to me because um, if I can inspire women and help and support so so house actually um, reached out to me and I started a program for them which is called women in drinks and so I do monthly training for them at the moment in the UK, but they're looking at like turning that into probably a global platform as well, which is again about um, 
building you know knowledge and education and inspiration so every month it's a different guest speaker that comes in and talk about different topics so we did everything from like learning cocktail technique like why we shake what we stir to um, cocktail family to true hospitality and service um, with um, Anna from like the, the Artesian, the Langham. So every month I create different trainings for them to, to build that community and learn. Can I also, speaking of women hospitality, do you think our industry offers enough opportunities for women? What I think our industry is one that can be challenging when, um, when it comes to, you. I mean, if realistically, and I think that's like what makes the industry so amazing, but like there's not that many people in our industry that were like, when I grew up, I want to be a bartender. You know, there is yeah. definitely, but there is a lot of people that ended up working in hospitality industry during university or after university as a job just until they were moving on to another job and then ended up loving it so much that they wanted to stay in this industry. And that's why there's so many people in hospitality industry with like amazing different degrees and like that what makes it like so creative and so interesting, I believe. Um, but I think that the how we can grow in this industry, what is the next step? Can we, because bartending is physically mentally and emotionally is so challenging i think that like as a woman there is also a question on like how how can i have a family how yeah. can i remain in this industry so i think that like it is a bit challenging and i don't think that it's just for for women um but i do think that there is more and more women behind the bar i think that there is um more you know to like we can definitely um increase this number and i think um, you have to and make sure because I, I think that like men and women have a different way of um, reacting to certain situation. We have different palettes um, <coughs> and having a mixed team is so important. Oh, 100 percent. Now I want to jump into something completely different. Mm -hmm. So when you were working for Saint Germain, you published your first cocktail book. How to Drink French Fluently. I love the title, by the way. I think it's such a dope title. Um, it's actually a, a Rob Cooper. Oh, right. It is. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So how did, your book, how did the book come about? And, um, and how did you find the process of writing or curating the, the, the book? Because I know a lot of people listening, you know, will, you know, one of the things that there's so many things people dream about doing um, when they work in, in our industry. You know, I think one of them is becoming a band, brand ambassador. Another one is publishing a book. And a third one will be probably opening their own venue, right? Mm -hmm. So you've done at least two of these. You've started your own business, which is all three. So, you know, how was that process? How did you find the, the, the process of doing it? Um, and what were some of the challenges that you faced? So, I mean, it was an amazing opportunity and I loved um, being able to do that. We also did the book in collaboration with Punch Magazine in the US, which they were just like the dream team to work with. Um, because they have such a strong understanding of the trade. Um, and so the book is an idea and it's like of something that I had before because I guess what I wanted to do was to create a book that will be interesting for bartenders but also helpful for consumer. And I think that like when it comes to cocktail, we sometimes focus so much on like the ingredients and like I think that sometimes for, for consumer, when they read menus, it's really hard to understand, to be like, cool, half of the ingredients, I have no idea what, it, what they are. Oh, man. And I reading cocktail lists, and I'm like, what the heck is this meant to taste like? Yeah, you and know? exactly. And then it comes to like, I have no clue what it will taste like. And so I wanted to create a book that will showcase the versatility of Saint-Germain because um, Saint Germain is su such an incredible product when it comes to versatility, but sometimes a little bit like misunderstood. And I think that like we could open minds a bit more on like how to use it. So that was definitely the idea also of of the book. And then I wanted to explain a bit more on what to drink and when to drink it. And so that's why the first book, How to Drink French Friendly, was about. Um, cocktail for different moments of the day and so starting from brunch we said that breakfast was a bit too early so started from brunch and then afternoon cocktail aperitif dinner and nightcap so it was very much of like 
wh why a brunch cocktail would be different, way different than your nightcap, mm. you know, and like everything in between. And what is the palette of like um, the daytime drinker and what is the purpose of an aperitif? Um, so it was amazing to be able to like create a cocktail book that had that had all this like um, nuggets of like information into it. And then for the cocktail book, I again, for me being a global ambassador wasn't about myself, but it was about creating opportunities for bartenders around the world. And so I decided to like not put any of my recipe in the book, but actually give the platform for bartenders around the world to be able to like create cocktails and submit that. And so the first one, we did it in the U.S. And so How to Drink French Friendly is bartenders from the U.S. And then we did How to Spritz French Friendly, yes. which is was about more showcasing the spritz category. And I think that like the idea behind that was people were just getting a bit fed up with um, the limited spritz option that yeah. was like that consumer were drinking. Let's say that you know name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I wanted to show how excited this category was and the fact that like a spritz is, you know, not just an apple spritz or St. German spritz, but can be so much more and like sh so showcasing also the fact that like spritz wasn't something just for summer. So it's organized by like different season and talking about like seasonality and this book actually featured partners from all around the world. So that was an amazing opportunity. That's awesome. It was so great to work on that. And did you find that, that your degree in communication helped you in terms of putting the book together or? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, my degree in communication and m even more than my degree, I guess my like interest in communication and branding and all of that really helped me definitely to like um, build Saint Germain, build Madame Saint Germain as the persona of uh, of the, um, the the brand and to launch my business. That definitely helped me. Um, it was an amazing experience to be able to do that. Um, I'm actually working on. La Maison Wellness book, which oh, is wow. the, um, the Mindful Cocktail book, um, which I'm still looking for a publisher in the UK that will be a good fit for that. But I'm really excited to be able to bring that book, which this time will be um, my recipes and, uh, and a different approach to it. Oh, that's so, awesome. So, yeah. So, the, who, you talked about getting a publisher for this book. Who's the publishers for the other book? Were they Punch Magazine. Punch so, Magazine, Punch okay. Magazine is also a publisher in the US. Um, so I had the opportunity to do that with them. And obviously doing it with St. Germain was, I mean, it was so great. It was an incredible experience. And to be able to give this platform for bartenders was really amazing. That's awesome. Um, so and yeah. is it available in bookstores or is it just through? It's on Amazon. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, both books are on Amazon and then in different bookstores. Amazing. And on their website. Now there's so much to talk about. We c I could talk about books and writing forever, but you also got to <laughs> talk about La Maison Wellness. Um, but great quickly before yeah right your, your <laughs> french is getting very good <laughs> it's getting better <laughs> i need some i need some champagne to really help it um i'm way better once i had a bottle of champagne um but quickly before we get into the to my son wellness i just want a couple of questions on on health and wellness mm -hmm. so you know on your instagram and social social these days it is very much about yoga i think right um, how did what led you to pursue this in a more professional manner i imagine at some point, the, like I've had to go through a, a piece where I've gone, hang on, if I'm going to live this lifestyle, I need the, uh, yeah. <laughs> some counterbalance. Is Absolutely. that kind of what happens for you as well? Or yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, we were talking about how challenging being a global ambassador can be. And I had that moment where I felt that I just needed to find more balance. And I felt like that. Um, it was unsustainable and I felt like I was running on empty and so and more than that so it was like very much of like my journey through that um, I was very lucky to have a mother that was um, a yogi so like practicing yoga oh, wow. and very much into um, self-awareness and living mindfully um, she is not around anymore unfortunately but um, she will be 
definitely laughing at me because in my like teens year or my early 20s she kept being like Cammy you have to be you know practice more like mindfulness and um you should practice yoga and I could be like no mom that's your thing and now she would be like are you joking me? Uh, <laughs> which is great um amazing. But so I guess I had this like awareness of of it even if I wasn't practicing it until um my um, I will say like mid-20s um I was aware of like all this like more mindful practices and so and that includes meditation right? that includes meditation and yoga and living well as a like eating mindfully and um, drinking mindfully etc so I guess like the whole picture of being a healthy hedonist and she was very much doing it in that way of um, she was um, full of life and very like loving life and celebrating life but she was also mindful in that approach and um, and very aware of um, herself and what she needed for her so, body so and her mind. So what does your practice look like in terms of like time spent? Do you, you know, how many, how do you, do you meditate twice a day, once a day? How often do you do yoga? What does your practice day look like? In I terms mean, my, of my practice and, and that's the, the beauty of it evolves so much with, with you. And so to, to go back a little bit to like the origin and why um, I became more, I guess, vocal about you know, wellness and mindfulness is because I remember having that moment. I was living in New York and I was like, I can't be this person that only share on social media the glamorous side of being an ambassador. I want to use this platform and use the voice that I have in this industry because I was, I'm lucky to have a voice in this industry to use it to inspire people. And so that's very much where it started. And I was like, I'm going to talk about my journey um, in this and hopefully inspire people to, to, to become more mindful and maybe try different practices that I will be trying. And the result was incredible. I had so many people reaching out to me and saying thank you so much. That inspired me to start yoga or meditation or whatever like movement um, they, were, they were practicing and, uh, and mindfulness they were practicing. And it was amazing to be able to be part of that. And that became very quickly a bigger part of like what I wanted to bring in this industry. And I think that like for, for me being a global ambassador was always about bringing back to the community and then wellness became like a bigger piece of what I wanted to bring back. And so that's the reason why I decided that I wanted to learn more and I wanted to be able to share more and to teach more. And I decided to go to India to do my, my yoga teacher training and certified as a, as a teacher and then to take on like many other like different workshop and different teacher training um, in different countries to keep on learning as much as I could about what is you know my movement which is yoga but also about meditation and mindfulness i did my teacher training in meditation as well oh, awesome. and it was amazing to be able to share that which doesn't always resonate with everyone because some people don't want to practice yoga or meditation um but i think it's more than like that's the the movement that i do um but if you like like running well running can be like you know a meditation which is a moving meditation if you like um going to the gym that's all i think that like for me it's more about mindfulness and living mindfully than like what is the actual exercise or movement that you do. Um, my practice evolves so much. I mean, I had to, you know, I was like practicing um, dynamic yoga every day uh, for years. And I was like, one of the reasons why I got into yoga is because I couldn't do any other practices. Like I couldn't like, I mean, I could have gone to the gym, um, but it's not especially like, the practice that I liked to and, and enjoyed doing the most. And so I couldn't really go to like sign up to a club or anything because I was on the road most of the time. It's very and so hard like when you travel. it's really hard when you travel and like yoga was I bought myself a travel mat and then I will pack that in my suitcase and just take it everywhere with me. Practice in my bedroom, um, in my hotel room or find a studio in any cities that I was going to uh, which was great because yoga is becoming so popular all around yeah. the world that it was always a studio that I could go and practice to and meet like-minded people and do something that was like also not just connected to, to the trade and to the hospitality industry and then take that back into the industry to inspire people. And, um, 
and that has been amazing to you. I mean, like, I always have people that say to me, oh, you inspired me so much on, like, starting to do this, or when I look at, like, your social media, I find it, like, so refreshing and so inspiring, and that's amazing. Like, for me to to be able to be that voice in the industry, I'm so grateful that's for that. That's amazing. That's for great. Sure. And how often do you, and how, just to, how often do you meditate? Or do you do it every day? So my meditation... I try, but it's hard. Yeah, I mean, my practice is, I think that, like, there is no, like... I was talking about that today at the launch. It's like, I don't think there is, like, um, it has to be that way. Like, you know, no. yes, they will recommend, like, you should practice 20 minutes in the morning. Or, But for me, is my practice evolves where I'm at at the moment. And I guess, for example, in the past couple of years, which has been a quite of a big transition for me, um, all I was craving was for more quiet time and grounding practice and more yin and I had no like I had no fire to burn you know like everything was so unsettled in my life changing on the personal and professional way that like I just needed to have a practice that will make me feel like both of my feet were on the ground you know what I mean and so my handstand practice would definitely not a question that was like not what I was like drawn towards to but what I needed was like to do more restorative more calm practices um meditation was definitely an anchor but like it was also a very challenging practice for me for for the past um few months because there was like it was so overwhelming with everything happening that like there was a lot of like thing coming up and emotion coming up um so i guess like meditation i try to meditate every day yeah absolutely sometime is yes i I take this like 20 minutes in the morning and i feel great and i feel like that i have a clear mind and i feel more centered and i feel like that i have more space in in my mind for sure um but often is i'm gonna grab this like two minutes in that uber ride when i'm on my way to that you know meeting or events or whatever the reason why i'm in an uber or if i'm on the plane or i'm sitting and i'm actually my meeting is like 15 minutes late so i'm just going to take a moment to like focus on my breath and just be in the moment in the present and bring some like awareness and that can be just like waking up in the morning and do a gentle body scan to see how I'm feeling like mentally, physically and emotionally. So I think that like meditation doesn't have to be that like we all picture it as like sitting on the top of a mountain (laughs) with like switching your mind off. Like that's just never going to happen. But like the practice of mindfulness and self-awareness is definitely the way forward and the way to grow. Um, Because if you're aware of the state of your body and your mind, then you can support yourself in the best way. I I, I agree. I've I've been meditating for the last year. I find it very interesting. Yeah, Yeah. I really enjoy it. I do enjoy it. But I do find finding the time is important to to do and I schedule in time so I can. And I think scheduling is a really great way to do it. Like I tend to schedule my yoga practice or my meditation pra- practice the same way that I will do it with a meeting. Yes. So like I block that in my calendar is there it's n- like that is no option to like um, change that. It h- I've been definitely finding um, hard in the past few months because launching of a, a business yeah. um, and trying to like find my balance i feel like that as a global ambassador i kind of like had that locked in you know it was like so many years of like being on the road and like i had my system of like bringing my breakfast with me when i was traveling and like all the things that like will make me feel um good because obviously what you eat what you drink the way you live has an impact on your body and your mind so that i feel like that balance i had it now being a founder and um an entrepreneur definitely more like the learning um because it's obviously non-stop um because i also teach yoga and meditation yeah. quite a lot so like finding the space and the time for myself um and making that space is hasn't been always easy it's, recently it's difficult i think one thing that you know one thing to take away for for those listening and something that i've learned as well is that you know if you aim to find time y- it's not gonna happen Whereas if you schedule time, the chances are it will. Yeah. And a lot of time, a lot of things you want to achieve, you go, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can't find time. I'll, I'll, there's just not enough hours. 
if you schedule the time, yeah. it's different. You know, there are there are time. There's time for it. I got one last question on, on health before um, we go into the, the new business. Have you found any specific health and wellness programs in, in bar groups around the world that you that you think others should look to adopt? Because I mean, something I'm asking kind of myself here. Um, you know, I I believe it's ex- extremely important in my life to to be healthy. Um, and to counteract the enormous amounts of whiskey and champagne that go into <laughs> my body, um, which are not the recommended dosage, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But delicious. But delicious, yes. <laughs> and I don't want to have a life without it. Um, that's not an option for me. Um, but, you know, I do also believe it's important for my team, you yeah. know. And so I'm looking at how I can do that. Have you come across any venues or groups that do health and wellness really well p- for their t- for their staff? Um because I imagine be, you'd be a bit more aware of it or yeah. conscious of it than most. And to be honest, I wouldn't be able to like name um, one group that is like, I feel like that there is more and more groups creating an environment where people feel um, more supported and safe to talk and share and reach out when, when needed. I feel like that um, venues are doing a lot more of like... Um, activities that can be like you know yoga meditation like going going to the gym together going to your heat class etc which is great on like team building but also to make sure um people keep their their balance um i wouldn't be able to like name one group on the top of my mind but i'm actually um really honored and so excited because at bar awards on tuesday i'm presenting that awards so there's a health and wellness program um here in australia that is part of the the bar Bar awards Awards, and i will be presenting that which is great so i can't wait to like hear more about the nominees for for australia what my goal is going to be that if you ever get asked this question in the future hopefully the speakers group will come to mind although i don't think we're nominated for that award because we haven't started a program yet (laughs) (laughs) but i'm working on what it's going to look like now so and I think that, like, you just to, to finish on that, I think that, like, you're really, you're right, because the the practice of mindfulness, and that can be, you know, just, like, um, focused awareness, so, like, being in the moment and present and focusing on your breath, that can be any type of meditation that you practice. Um, I truly believe that, like, that will make you more centered and grounded and have more clarity which will make you a, like better at your job which will make you better with your partner with your family with your friend and just a better human as a whole yeah, no, and so um that's the reason why it's a daily practice and it's so important and the daily practice sh- should be incorporated in the workplace absolutely yeah it's something we, I mean, we had a, we had a management retreat or summit um, for our top managers at actually at my house for for three days um, earlier this year, and one of the things that we we taught everybody was box breathing um, or tactical breathing, depending on p- the word you use for it, and just as a way of recognizing when you get triggered in a venue and having a way to quickly calm yourself so you could still deal with a team member or deal with a with the guest um, who's triggered you, yeah. um, but without, of course, you know getting too involved so being able to do quick box breathing exercise to calm yourself down i think is really important it's it's not a tool that i was taught to have um although in the navy we we did learn other methods so we didn't get too carried away um so i'm quite blessed of having that there is a quote that says that um between the stimulus and your reaction that space and that time is where our freedom lives and i feel like that sometime when you we get overwhelmed when our stress container became over flooded there's no space into that we just react as soon as like the stimulus comes in and i think the practice of meditation and mindfulness but also breathing technique can really help you to step away from that and have that space i was just reading um a friend of mine posted that deep breath is like sending love notes to your body and i said that was just such a great way to to put it um so i will definitely be quoting that quite a lot it's quite amazing i've I've started doing it with my kids so when they get because kids can get really upset over seemingly nothing right so and it's just the examples that can make them angry just there are too many to, to, to mention really but i did find 
that sitting down with them and doing box breathing or even just holding their hands and just doing 10 deep breaths, it's gone. The anger is gone. Yeah. It's quite amazing. They just need a slight distraction. Um, and having seen that in the kids, I was like, well, hang on, I won't take this to my workplace. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so onto, onto your business. So obviously you still work with, with Saint Germain, but you're no longer an employee, right? No. Um, and I've been uh, kind of accused of being a serial entrepreneur by my wife and others. Um, so I, I can understand the, the entrepreneurial bug. So what, what made you decide to do your own thing? Um, and of course, can you tell us a bit more about what it is? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the I mean, decision making process is very interesting to me. <laughs> so, I mean, it was a long process. And when I say that, like, it took me a couple of years to really define on what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. Um, and I kind of had that moment where I felt like that. I wasn't even sure that I could, that I was like belonging in the hospitality industry anymore, to be quite honest. Uh -huh. And I think that like I decided to go on to do my teacher training in, um, in India, came back, launched Healthy Hospital with Tim. Oh, yeah. um, so we launched that together and I was uh, helping him to, to bring this project to life, which was amazing. And we really um, created a platform for people to, um, to learn more and hopefully to like build um, a happier, healthier and more sustainable hospitality industry. And so I was on to that journey and then started teaching more. And I felt like that um, I was stepping away a little bit from the hospitality industry. And like I wasn't going out as much, even if I was still working on Saint-Germain. I already knew that I was leaving Saint-Germain because I gave Saint-Germain a year. Um, of um, for us to transition because obviously I was on that brand for so long. Um, there was some internal conversation on what could be done as me becoming, tap, like doing more of a wellness role within the company, but it was just not, it, it wasn't really the right time and it wasn't really allowing me to do what I wanted to do, which was inspiring the trade, but also inspiring consumer. And so, um, I mean, it was not an easy process and it felt like, I mean, you know, Madame Saint-Germain for so many years, it was like a lot of like peeling off the layers and discovering of like what I wanted to do and who I was underneath. Not that like Madame Saint-Germain wasn't me because it was, um, but it was more the what is the next step? How can it be a next step? And, um, and I didn't, I wasn't so keen on going out and drinking and, um, I guess because personally I was going through a big transition and a big change and I decided that I wanted to make... Can I ask what the transition was? Um, I left a company yeah. and um, ended a, mar a marriage. Um, and so because of this like transition um, of... I mean, he is someone so important in my life and will remain for um, ever mm. and ever, but it was we just grew apart and right. we just... Um, I felt like that it was a moment when like when you feel that like it's the time to change um, and it was a big change because it was a life change yeah. you know and so um, there was kind of like this moment when I was like I don't really want to drink alcohol because right now <laughs> there's a lot of like yeah. things to process emotionally and uh, and um, I just felt like that making all those big decisions if I was going to just drink um, my way through it was just not honoring the decision that I was making and the the change that I was trying to do and the life goal that I was trying to set for myself. Wow. So I kind of like really, really cut back on drinking and wasn't really drinking as much and realized that um, there was definitely a lot of like missing opportunity for mindful drinking and um, really changed my approach to um the cocktail moment and to what mindful drinking could look like. Um, and I had this moment when I was like, oh gosh, am I still part of this industry? And at the same time, I, you know, I was still passionate about it and love this industry. Um, 
And then I kind of like took it back and I was like, okay, what do I love in this industry? And why did I feel like in love with this industry? Um, And the cocktail creation was a big part of it. Like I love creating cocktails and I love creating something that will be an experience that will taste delicious. And I was like, but if I don't really want to drink alcohol, can I still do that? Um, And then realized that I wanted to give opportunities for people that I wanted to inspire people to become more mindful in the way that they live. And for me, that includes how we drink. And I think that like we are conscious of like we know that we need to move in some ways. You know, for me, it's yoga for others, it's like different practice. Yeah. Um, but we know that like moving is important. We know that like what we eat um, definitely has an impact on our body, but also our mind. Like, you know, you are what you eat. We know that. Um, but mindfulness and wellness is becoming definitely something that like we understand a bit more but then when it comes to drinking (laughs) well um I feel like that people aren't always really mindful in the way that they do that and I'm not saying that like you people like we shouldn't drink alcohol I still drink alcohol I just do it in the way that I'm like I have a more mindful approach to it and mindful means I try to drink um good product when it comes to cocktail try to use um great ingredients um that um comes to the mindful cocktail that i create and then understanding of am i drinking because it's a beautiful moment that i'm sharing with a friend or um it's one of like life simple pleasure and it's beautiful or am I drinking for another reason? Yeah. Am I drinking because it's a coping mechanism and I don't really want to look into that corner that I'm avoiding of those things yeah. that are there? Or And if it's, if that's the case, then um, I think that like the, the approach should be different. And so through uh, this like whole process of like thinking of um, our relationship with alcohol in hospitality industry, but also how embedded alcohol is in our society i mean you're having you have something to celebrate you drink champagne delicious you have you know you have a a bad day you definitely want to go out for a drink like i feel like that very often alcohol is the answer when um when it comes to um to our way of like dealing with things i think so too um i think that you brought something really interesting there in the in in terms of the mindful drinking because i was i'm glad you when you said, I'm more mindful when I drink, I'm like, oh, God, I have to ask what, what it is. And then you explain what it was. But the thing that I found really interesting was the, the why I'm drinking. And I think mm-hmm. that's a, it's actually done a lot of research on addiction. And mm-hmm. when it comes into addiction, from what I've read recently and, and, and heard, it's less about, the al- about alcohol, but more about why. So you can have people, and I have, you know, I used to do a detox every year for, for a month just to prove to myself I wasn't an alcoholic because um, I drank a lot and still do, but, but, but not as much. And, um, but because I was in a good place, I never drank to escape my world. Yeah. I only ever drank because I really enjoyed, th- enjoyed it or I drank because I was with friends or I drank because I was celebrating or I drank because it was work. Um, and so I, I didn't become addicted. Whereas if you drink to escape... It's um there's there's a there's a danger. Yeah. So and I think and I, I do now, I will sit down and go, Why am I drinking? And that the why means I drink less. Yeah. But I also I drink way better. And uh, I think that's that's very much um my definition of mindful drinking. You know, for me, mindful drinking means understanding why you're drinking, um, what you're drinking, when you're drinking, and having just like being able to answer those questions, then you become more aware and so you become more mindful in the way that you do it. Yeah. And having a cocktail that's a beautiful cocktail with alcohol that you enjoy um, in a mindful way, which means you're sipping, sipping and de- like and enjoying that cocktail that like you're having, that's great. That's mm. beautiful. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that like if you're saying yes to this gin and tonic because you don't know what else to have and you feel like that you're out so well you won't have a drink then I I don't think that's the answer and I think that like we should be able to provide um option for everyone that includes non-alcoholic option low alcoholic option or you know regular cocktail um with regular strengths that we're like more used to for everyone to have option for that and 
the whole idea of La Maison Wellness was to inspire and educate people when it comes to mindful drinking and mindful living. Um, and to show that like mindful drinking can be delicious and exciting and to empower people to be able to make the decision that work for them. And that can be that cocktail that they want or that can be that non-alcoholic beer because they want to have a beer, but they don't really want to have the impact of the alcohol on their body or their mind because right now for them it's not working or to know that like there is not alcoholic cocktail that can be delicious and it doesn't have to feel like you, that you ordering from the kids menu or that you left out and you don't belong there and I think that working in the hospitality industry we should be able to provide that because we are an industry of service and an industry of hospitality. Oh, yeah. And true hospitality means being able to look after everyone that walk into your bar. And if they're not drinking alcohol for whatever reason it is, that can be a pregnancy, that can be a health condition, that can be a religious belief or a lifestyle decision, we should be able to look after them. 100%. 100%. I mean, we're not in the business of selling alcohol we're in the yeah. business of providing experiences right so it's absolutely alcohol does not have to be part of it and i think that like that's the moment when i realized and it reminded me why i am still in hospitality industry is when i reminded myself that the dna of this industry is not alcohol the center of what what we do is not the spirit and the alcohol is actually the hospitality 100 um and coming back to that made me feel like that I, I still had um, the right and, the, and a purpose in this industry, the right to be in this industry and a purpose in this industry, and um, that I wanted to, to be um, part of the leading movement of the mindful drinking to inspire people to, to live well and to really feel empowered when it comes to making the decision that work for them. Amazing. Now, don't have too many questions to go. Uh, well, I've got loads of questions, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask more. A um, uh, quick one, I w I'm, I'm quite curious. How have you found a transition from employee to business owner? Like, what have the challenges been for you in doing that? Because um, that's got to be some. I mean, I <laughs> mean, how long do we have? <laughs> um, the short <it's>, version. <laughs> I feel like that um, the process that I've been through on, like, really creating this idea and being able to combine and to be able to, like, grow um, – individually like as a person but also in my career has been an amazing journey not an easy one but an amazing one for sure I feel like that the the wins have been so rewarding you know to like everything that I managed to like put in place and and grow and the support and the enthusiasm that I see around La Maison Wellness um is so rewarding and so incredible the challenges have been the most incredible opportunity for growth um, and to learn. Um, I will say that, like, I mean, the having an ID and um, ha having to be, at the moment, <laughs> the only person that can bring that to life is very challenging yeah. um, because as much as Saint-Germain was part of a big company but still keeping the mindset of more of like an entrepreneurial, you know, it was, it's part of incubation brand within the Bacardi portfolio, etc. I mean, we still had an amazing support. Like it was like team all around the world and um, working with incredible agencies, etc., etc. When now is um, the AD is in my head and um, I guess... It's your money too. It's my money and it's very much of the... Well, if I don't put like bring it to life, it just won't come to life. And so I was always like taking the the analogy of working for a company is kind of like having like a big boat. Like it, you know, there's like a lot of people like rowing, or there's definitely like an engine that is like making the boat move. And like you're part of it, and you're like definitely doing your part of the work. And it's hard work, definitely sometimes, um, but. It's still, uh, there's a system, there's a team, there's staff, there's like, if you stop, if you like go to the bathroom, then the body's still moving, right? Yeah. Um, when being an entrepreneur and launching your own business means that like, if you stop growing, well, your body's going nowhere, <laughs> you know? Um, 
and even like being here in Australia with like London Cocktail Week being just around the corner um that means that like I have like amazing days here when like um, I do the collaboration with uh, with Saint Germain and uh, and La Maison Wellness. But then I go back to to the hotel and need to like work on so many other projects. I mean, I'm like flying back next week, going to Rome for Rome Bash or for a day to do um, a wellness presentation with Martini, and then I fly to Portugal to host a one week retreat on my healthy hedonist retreat, which is yoga, meditation, and mindful drinking. So it's like managing that, and the week after that is London Cocktail. So you have to like um, be organized and um, be creative in the way that like you can deal and juggle with uh, with everything. But it's amazing. I mean, like I fell deeply inside me that it was it's been the right decision. Um, I do think that like I've done everything I could have done on Saint Germain to help and grow this brand, and um, I think that like now I don't work for Saint Germain anymore. I do a few collaboration and helping on like more the ambassador program and things like that. But I still do some work with Bacardi on different projects. And I actually feel like that I can put my skills and my passion um, into something that is actually helping even more being on my own with a different company. So no, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing journey. Um, I think the first year is insanely challenging to yeah. learn how to like um find the balance and and grow um but it's great it's been so great so it's far. awesome it's yeah. one of the i actually just before our thing now we we're running a pathway to partnership program in our in our bar business where eight people are going on a nine-month journey where we teach them everything we know about running a business opening a business being an owner and then we will fund a 50 so we'll pay 90 percent of the cost but there's a 50 50 partnership in it um but yeah just before you came in i spent you know a big part of the, of the session was talking about the the downsides of having a business so mm-hmm. the challenges that comes with it um but also the the upsides that mm-hmm. come with it right and then trying to find a balance mm-hmm. and there are there are trade-offs you know there's an amazing having i'm a worked for myself for 15 years i'm completely unemployable um i think but i love it you know some days <laughs> and then there are other days i wish i could go to work and Absolutely. switch off at 5 p.m and go home and yeah. i have to worry about it right so it's uh yeah it's definitely it's a journey for yeah sure. it's a journey yeah, yeah it's got its rewards and it's got its drawbacks as well yeah. um one of my last questions uh the move towards low abv cocktails is kind of a, a relatively new one like what do you think is driving that kind of movement at the moment i think that like there is um the mindful drinking movement was something that was that has been very much driven by consumer um when it comes to non-alcoholic um sidlib has done an amazing job at paving the way and opening the mind on um what you drink when you're not drinking alcohol um I think that like there is very much of an awakening and realization of the impact of what we drink on our body and our mind and a desire for people to live well. I think we are also definitely living in um, like urban cities, like fast paced life where people are trying to like put everything in. Um, and waking up with a sore head will not help you do that, for sure. Um, so I think people are be- being a bit more mindful and a bit more conscious of like what they eat, how they live, what they drink. Um, I think bartenders are all, you know, also um, staying in their job way longer than probably before um, and growing. I mean, I remember being at Cocktail Spirits a few years ago and Jim Mahan doing a talk on I guess like wellness in the hospitality industry but more in the sense of you know talking about the elephant in the room and how much like people in hospitality industry drink and how um 
and it was amazing, you know, that to have like he is a dear friend, and it was so great to have him on the stage with so many bartenders from all around the world, literally like listening to every single word coming out of his mouth because he is so well known and respected, and him be like, I don't understand why. Um, I don't feel like I belong to this industry anymore because I don't want to be out at five in the morning because I say no to the shot that you're trying to like force down my throat and being really open and really like um, vocal about it, which was amazing. So I think that there is a bit of like a realization from the hospitality industry as well on if you want to make this sustainable and if you want to be successful in the industry, you cannot wake up with a hangover every day. That's just a fact. Not every day. Not every day. That doesn't mean that you can't have a hangover, like, but just not every day. And I yeah. think that like, it comes back to being aware, self-aware, and being mindful in the way that you do it. On Never the, saying and that having, like... And having a plan. I used to go to yeah. Tales and I used to tell people, I had a, people would come to me and go, hey, what's the, do you have any like, tips for, for Tales? I'm like, I got a very simple play for Tales. I'm like, I never go to Hotel Montreal. Because ever. Because whenever you're there, there's always somebody there with two or three bottles of something that want to give you a layback of, and I don't go. Um, I never go to Alibi. <laughs> alibi is the death sentence <laughs> for the next day. If you find yourself at Alibi at two in the morning, you're gonna you're gonna be hurting the next day. And I say no to all the shots. Yeah. Right. And I was like, but not doing shots and laybacks, not being at Alibi, and not being at Montleon, I could go and have an amazing experience still drink still be out but those things and i still have a survival i haven't had a shot in years i don't do shots mm -hmm. because the shots only serve one purpose and that is to get you drunk quicker yeah. there's no enjoyment in a shot uh you don't s you don't enjoy a shot yeah. you endure a shot <laughs> i think it was um jared brown that says that thinking that i'm gonna butcher that quote which is really annoying that thinking that we drink to get drunk is saying that you only have sex to make babies yeah yeah <laughs> you know and i i just think that like you can drink without getting drunk and 100%. just enjoy the experience of having delicious cocktail that tastes amazing that you share with great company. Definitely when you're at Tales, you get to like see everyone from all around the world, which is such an amazing way to like um, gather with, uh, with all our friends from all around the world. And that doesn't mean that you have to end up drunk every night. I do think that like our industry is lacking of non-alcoholic option and taking seriously the non-alcoholic option um, because I think that we should have more option for like I was at Tales this year and decided to do Tales sober, not because I don't drink alcohol anymore, because yeah. I do love my champagne as well. Um, but I just wanted to experience it and I wanted to see also because I had a really, really busy time and I was like, oh, I mean, I need to, yeah. <laughs> to be able to, to keep a clear mind. But uh, um, I just wanted to experience what it will be like to not be drinking at Tales and to see if I could still feel like I was part of the experience and feel like that I could belong at all the parties and go to bars, etc. Um, I mean, the offer was non-existent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it, it I drink a lot of soda water. <laughs> it's great. Tales, <laughs> yeah, Tales is not set up for that, I think. But, you know, most bars today are... I mean, what do you, how do you, do you prefer the word mocktail or non-alcoholic cocktail? I feel... I'm not a big fan of mocktail because I feel like there is a sound. I it's mean, a stigma it, with it as well. You know, I, I think non-alcoholic cocktails is, is more today, whereas mocktail is an, yeah. ah, it's it was the shitty, shitty yeah, cousin. Yeah, the sugary, like, yeah. the thing that comes with, like, the rainbow and... Um, oh, it's two juices in the blender. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, like, non-alcoholic cocktail um, is definitely more... Um, crafted and put together i do think that like th we haven't found a word for it because non-alcoholic cocktail is kind of like saying that there's something missing yeah. something non-existent in the cocktail which is not a great way to to <laughs> talk about a cocktail um i call my drink mindful cocktails because it's a mindful approach to it some of them um, are non-alcoholic low abv or um regular strength um but i think that like what i'm trying to show is that mindful drinking is an experience and an approach and when i serve cocktail 
very often people don't even realize that some of them are non-alcoholic. They just think that they taste delicious and they look amazing and it's a great experience. And I like the idea of a drink being a drink. And yes, sometimes there's no ABV and sometimes there's low ABV, um, which is mostly what I do know and low um, this y- these days. But, um, but I think that like alcohol doesn't always have to be part of the equation when it comes to a cocktail moment. And I think that like you can still enjoy a beautiful evening um, drinking non-alcoholic. Of course, 100%. Yeah, no, I do. I don't do, I don't do the whole evening normally, but I do drink non-alcoholic drinks. I, I'm not a big fan of the, of the um, so-called non-alcoholic spirits, mm-hmm. but that's probably not something we need to get into. Um, I just think it's a it's it's misguided labeling um, in that it's predominantly flavored water and we have words for these things. Um, but I do think putting together a drink without mm-hmm. alcohol in it is completely yeah. fine, and we I do it in all our venues, you know. Yeah, um, and I do think that like some non-alcoholic spirits um, are great, and they are way more than just flavor water, um, and they definitely give a body and a structure to the cocktail that will make your drink taste like a cocktail and not just a juice or a smoothie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's some great brands out there. I think there is more um, knowledge and education. The fact that they call spirits that can be questionable. 100%. Right? Um, but I think that like what is very excited with the mindful drinking movement and with the non-alcoholic category is everything is up in the air and there to be shaped at the moment. Um, and I'm excited to see where we can take that and how we can create more and more offer um, for customers to know that they can go to bars even if they're not drinking alcohol, that if they are drinking alcohol, there's option for low ABV and um, and regular strengths and helping them to navigate that. Because I do think that there's a lot of people in this world that want to change their relationship with alcohol, but they just don't know where to start. Exactly. Because they still want to be able to go out and socialize and because there's a little bit of a stigma around the fact that you don't really want to talk about it. Oh yeah, oh, and I've been there. Like I've been, there. Like, I did the three months of not drinking two years ago, and I was out constantly during those three months. And you know, when I was in my own venues, you know, I'd make it. I'd just go to my team and say, "I just want soda water, but make it look like a gin and tonic." You know, <laughs> you know, so it looks like I'm having a drink because um, you didn't want to have this conversation. I just didn't. Wa- I just didn't want to have to t- explain why I wasn't drinking. You know, um, that said, you know, I, and I do think it's it's it is hard when people do go out to have uh, a non-alcoholic drink, and I think venues in general need to, mine, mine own included, need to be better at offering that service, for sure. Uh, and and, making, it it and making them feel included, not and excluded. Absolutely, and that is exactly the reason why I created Lemons and Wellness, because I wanted to be able to create a platform where people can come and learn about mindful drinking, about non-alcoholic, about low ABV, and find recipes that will inspire them. And so the whole idea of Lemons and Wellness was to inspire and educate and give the tools and the information for everyone, trade and consumer, to be able to have to know that there is option out there if they don't want to drink alcohol or there is low ABV option that is cocktail that are made with more like mindful ingredients etc that's Um, awesome and I think that like that comes with education like when we will explain to bartenders how this like non-alcoholic spirits are made what are the options out there what cocktail that they can create then it will become something that is more important and take a bigger like place on menus because taking for example the uk there's 20 percent of the population in the uk that don't drink alcohol and that's just the adult population wow. and those 20 percent probably don't feel comfortable going out to bars because they know that like it's going to be a bit boring what they will get and exactly. some venues are doing an amazing job in the uk um when it comes to mindful drinking and non-alcoholic um which are like Lioness, the Hoxton Hotel just opened a venue that is doing an amazing job as well. The Connaught Hotel, um, Whistling Shop has done an amazing menu, et cetera. So there is definitely things moving, but I think that like we have to take that in consideration because yes, we love spirits. Um, and that's one of the things that like we are passionate about in this industry, but n- the non-alcoholic 
and the law ABV, it's a big part of like what we offer. I think so too. Now, just to kind of quickly uh, finish up, it's been an amazing conversation. Um, and we think it'd be, it's going to be our longest podcast today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you came all this way. I had to take advantage <laughs> of it, you know. Um, so in, now that you've left the corporate world and become an entrepreneur, do you, what do you know now that you wish you'd known before you kind of went off on your own? Have you had any learnings that you'd wish you'd know had before you started? I ask this of everyone who started their own bar or restaurant, any business, because I find, you know, with, I was telling the, my, my team today that, there are some things, if I had known, it's kind of like having kids. <laughs> if you'd known, I may have, would have done it. Um, and the same thing with opening a venue or starting a business. There's, there's things that you learn that you just kind of wish you had known coming in. Yeah. Um, have you had any of those moments where like, oh, God, like accounting, c- financial stuff, whatever. Anything that you'd, so you could share that bit of gem for those who are looking at doing their own thing. I wish I'd known this before I kicked off. It doesn't have to be bad. I think I feel like I am still so new into this journey and very much at the beginning that like I don't have the the distance and the space to really look into that yet. Um, I will say that um, surround yourself with people that can help and support. Find yourself a mentor. Absolutely. I think that like... um, going on your own can be quite like overwhelming and having people that like will inspire you um and give you a little bit of guidance um is great and i have like those people in my life um that i feel like that i can have this conversation when it comes to like business and you know because one thing that like i found um quite challenging being like an owner and uh, an an entrepreneur is not having a team where you can bounce ideas off. And so one side of what I do with Lemons and Wellness is the the consulting. Um, So I work with different brands on either helping them build their brand, the strategy or their ambassador program or the drink strategy, et cetera. And I love that part. It's a really, it's a, I try to keep it a small part of what I do because I need to be able to keep keep as much time as I can to build the brand. But obviously, this is a way for me to like fit into the business as I'm, I'm self-founded for the business. Um, but I love it. There's like few days of consulting that I do. I go in. So, for example, I do some project with Bacardi and I go in and it's so great to have a team and be able to brainstorm and bounce idea off each other. And I love that. And that's definitely something that like I find challenging when you're on your own is to not have that um, and have to make the decision. I mean, when I started my first few months, I was like freaking out about everything, like the color of like what, you you know, the branding, the things and like, I mean, freaking out in the sense of like, I feel like it was so hard to make all those decisions of my own and also amazing and very empowering. But, um, but yes, so like, um, that's definitely something that like surrounded yourself with people that you can have that and um and that can be like people that like you have as like contractor that you work with or more um friends of the business let's call that um one of my uh, um a dear person um to me said something that really resonated with me recently um he has he's been an amazing support in this um journey and um I was telling him about all those ideas that I had and like what I was like going through and and um and he said don't ever run your business being scared or you know and he was like don't think of like but what about if in 6 months I don't have enough money to do this and this and this and what about that run it as you believe and breathe this project and you believe that it will work because if you run it as like being scared and holding back you won't be able to grow it Um, and that really resonated with me because I felt like that I was holding back a little bit recently being like okay I really want to get this person on board and this person on board but what happened if I stop consulting for this brand which is very Mm. much the only way that I'm like fitting into the business at the moment and um I think that like letting go of that and really diving into let's bring this to life really helped me to um, have a bigger vision and um, and to really embrace the journey. That's awesome. That's such a great place to finish as well. I think that was fantastic. Thank you so much. This Thank has been you for having absolutely me. brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. That was wow. 
I can't wait to actually sit back and, and listen back to it. Thank you so much for joining us. That was awesome. Thank you for having me. Boom! <laughs> All right. Boom, baby. This is Sven again. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I hope you found that both interesting and informative and that there was something in there for you that you can take with you in your future career in hospitality. Now, if you want to follow what we're doing here at Ananas, pop over to our Facebook page. You can find us on facebook.com forward slash Ananas Academy. Give us a thumbs up and a like and there'll be loads of material on there. We'll be announcing any new courses and new podcasts on there as well. And if you're interested in learning more about what it takes to be a great bartender or a great waiter or a great server in general, go to anonymousacademy.com and create your own profile. Now, if you're an owner or a venue manager and you'd like to give the gift of Anonymous to your team, uh, you can visit anonymousacademy.com and create your own organization there and start inviting your team to start learning. That's it. Rock and roll. I hope to see you back here again soon for more podcasts. Cheers and kapow. Boom.